so people often, and so this is not just my opinion that physics is the best and the greatest. <laughs> uh, but, um, However, we'll put it out there. Physics but, is the uh, best, what we, right? What we know. <laughs> yeah. um, What people often say is that physics is the most uh, foundational. This is the Drive By History podcast. On today's episode, I'm joined by Dr. Brian Field, a physicist who helped us understand the world of Nikolai Tesla, as well as the ice trade here in the U.S. Let's get started. Brian, I'm so happy you're able to join us today. We miss having you up here in New Jersey. Thank you, Ken. It's a pleasure. And I miss uh, I miss being around. <laughs> I know, but at least you're only in D.C., so it's not too far. We can get you back up for another episode of Drive-By History. That's right. I'm not living on the moon, so I can come by whenever. <laughs> yet, yet. Knowing yes, you, yes. it's probably a possibility. <laughs> no, I'm so excited to talk with you. So one of the things, you're our science expert. You're the person who comes in and can explain to me why the world works the way it does. Why are those history markers are standing there talking about something and what, you know, what's the background behind the minerals there and all of that kind of information. I'm curious about your interest in physics. Can you give us a little background on yourself? Um, sure. Um, so I was I was born in Texas, mm -hmm. um, but I didn't live there very long. Uh, I moved away, I think, when I was six months old. Oh. As uh, my parents said, I was very precocious. <laughs> <laughs> they made you move out at six months. You were so precocious. <laughs> yeah. um, I actually moved to New Jersey uh, uh -huh. at that point, to which I stayed for about four years. Um, my very first memory is in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. But then my family moved to Arizona. And every memory after that is sort of starts up in in Arizona. And um, I I guess I came to science in general very early. Uh, you know, uh, someone had asked me this once uh, when I was uh, talking to a classroom full of people and they said, you know, why did you want to become a scientist? And uh, rarely do people ask that that exact question. And mm -hmm. uh, and I said, well, you know, it, it's um, it's how I wanted to understand the world. You know, some people, they they want to understand the world through people and, you know, they, they study psychology or relationships or sociology. Or they want to understand the world through money and they, they study finance and banking or, or you know, however they want to do it. And I, I wanted to understand the world as into, like, how does it work? How does uh, how does it um, operate? Mm -hmm. And uh, my uh, my grandfather was a chemist um, and my father was an electrical engineer, um, although he didn't do engineering when I was um, growing up. And so I just, there was always like a little bit of like, yeah, that's something that our family does, you know, it sort of goes into science. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was in high school, I was an exchange student in France for a short uh, period of time. And I took a book, I needed a book with me in case my French wasn't as good as I thought it was, <laughs> something to read. And uh, and I went and I picked up a book by Leon Letterman called The, uh, the God Particle. Mm -hmm. And it was a book about particle physics. And I, I remember thinking like this this is this is it this is what i want to do this is what i want to study um what he's talking about it just it it scratches every itch i've ever had with trying to understand the um the the universe so i actually went to the college that he taught at um but he was a nobel laureate so i didn't see him very much i think i saw him three times in the right. time i was there uh, i saw him more later as a as a professional uh, scientist Mm -hmm. uh, it was a college in Chicago, and uh, and then I went to graduate school in um, in New York, mm -hmm. and um, eventually moved around a lot um, around the world to do postdocs, and finally came back to New York to uh, to become a physics professor uh, for nine years before leaving um, uh, to work for the Department of Energy, which is where I'm at now, overseeing part of the science uh, that the that the government funds. So um, that's yeah. sort of my uh, my life path. That's fascinating. Can you talk a little bit where, about where physics fits within the world of science? Because we've got chemistry, we have biology, we have physics. I'll let you right. talk on it. So, um, so people often, and so this is not just my opinion that if physics is the best, the greatest. <laughs> but, um, However, we'll put it out there. But, physics is the but best, we, right? We know. <laughs> yeah. um, what people often say is that physics is the most uh, foundational. Mm -hmm. um, so, Sometimes people say uh, physics is only built on math, right? And so math is at the very bottom, and then uh, one level up is physics. Uh, built on top of physics is chem uh, uh, chemistry. Built on top of chemistry is, is biology, and on top of that, you have other of the social sciences and, and things like that. That's sort of our usual hierarchy, and there's some truth to it, right? You know, um, certainly people say like you couldn't understand chemistry without physics, which I think is probably true. 
Mm -hmm. But I don't think that you necessarily need to understand a great deal of physics to understand chemistry. It sort of stands on its own. And the same, like, you can't really understand biology without understanding chemical processes and therefore physical processes and, and so on and so forth. So there's a sort of hierarchy. Um, there's in old days, there was a very uh, distinct difference between astronomy and physics. Right. So yeah. like if you went back in time to say the time of Newton, you'd find the physics departments were in the um, were in the philosophy department. Right. You know, like natural philosophy was was what they called physics back in the day. But astronomy was sort of part of the liberal arts, and it was, uh, you know, um, more associated, closely associated with uh, with mathematics. The other thing with astronomy is <clears throat> you don't really do experiments in astronomy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's an observational uh, thing. I was going to say it's a little <laughs> difficult to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Although these days, you know, yeah. we're sort of finding these um, planets around other stars, and there's mm -hmm. a lot of people who actually try to recreate say the atmosphere of another planet. Mm -hmm. So we would know what we're looking for if we were to find it, you know? And, and so there, there's like a laboratory astrophysics that, uh, that people do, but that's very modern, right? Uh, tra traditionally, it's just an observational thing. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. So I'm curious then, uh, even through most of the 19th century, a lot of education was really based on the liberal arts. Can you talk a little bit about the education system and when sciences like physics really became a pursuit? It's it's true. Like yeah. uh, I was sort of doing a little research on this before before we spoke, and mm -hmm. um, I read the statistic that in 1900 there were only like 54 PhDs in physics in the entire United States. That's amazing. Uh, sounds low. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> but but what would these people be doing? You know, and the the thing is is that. Um, they would have been essentially doing a very weird kind of engineering, right? Mm -hmm. um, because our view of the of the fundamentals of the world, or astronomy, right? You know, um, uh, our kind of view of these things really wasn't all um, uh, advanced. There was really nothing for them to do. In fact, I remember reading um, this story about uh, Rutherford or or Michelson or one of these guys, and and he talked to one of his professors, and he said, "You really shouldn't go into this field because there's nothing going on." right? There's literally no future in it. And this was like the year before we discovered the electron, you know? And so it was like, yeah, the, at, at, he was right for the time, but at any moment yeah. it could change. So for a long time, the only reason people really went to college was either they wanted to go to a seminary, mm -hmm. right? Uh, or they wanted to go into the law, yep. uh, both which required apparently years and years of the study of Latin in mm -hmm. Greek, right? Mm -hmm. is, is, uh, if you went to college, you'd, you'd get real hard on the classics, you'd go through liberal arts, and you'd get a degree, but it wouldn't, you wouldn't get a degree in anything. It, we didn't have majors uh, for until very late in the game. Um, and if you, you, of course, you probably read um, The Great Gatsby. Mm -hmm. We did a whole episode on it, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Remember that in the beginning, the character had just finished college mm -hmm. and he was like a uh, Nick Carraway, right? So, mm -hmm. but I, and I thought I'd be a banker. So now I need to learn how to be a banker. Mm -hmm. He had just finished college, but he never did anything about Well, no, because he went through college reading classics or reading philosophy or whatever. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and there was yeah. this idea that college was, as they used to say, practice for life. You know, mm -hmm. it's supposed to give you this moral education, this sort of uh, understanding of history and, and these sort of things. But then your profession was something you did after that. Right. 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 And uh, that's very hard for the sciences. Uh, I mean, there's plenty to be learned from studying Latin and, and, and Greek and, and, and the, the liberal arts. I'm not disparaging them, mm -mm. but it's not a good preparation for a career in science. So right, right around the turn of the 20th century, uh, physics started to kick in. You know, some people say the the 19th century was chemists, you know, they, they sort of ruled the 19th century. 20th century has been very physics dominated. Mm -hmm. And I'd say the 21st century for a big part of it may or may not be sort of dominated by biology, you know, as we mm -hmm. understand it better to um, cure our diseases and mm -hmm. live longer and higher quality life. Certainly, we still make progress in chemistry, mm -hmm. still make progress in physics. But I think that we will see these huge changes in the way we live because of biology in the 21st century. Um, that's sort of my little um, prediction of things. So mm -hmm. in, the, in the early 1900s, when we started to understand that the world was made of atoms and that they don't obey the laws of physics as we understand them and we needed a new way of understanding them, that's when people had to start to become specifically trained as physicists and to to do experiments and use controls and, and to understand wow. that 
what we see of the universe is actually a very small portion of it. And uh, mm-hmm. that's something we learned in my lifetime while I was in graduate school. Wow. Was, so you were kind of on the cutting edge of this. Yeah. Like that. I mean, if I asked you like everything you have ever seen, mm-hmm. everything you have ever seen in the sky, all the stars, all mm-hmm. of it, anything you've ever seen picture of makes up about, you know, 4% of the universe. Mm-hmm. And here we were, you know, in, in the year 2000 and all of a sudden it's like we opened a door and there was an ocean there and no one had ever seen an ocean, never seen any of the life in it, never had any idea how it worked. And, you know, and that it, it, we are really, we are, we are like the 1%, you know, we are the tiny little fraction that we can see. We understand that part really well, <laughs> wow. but the rest of it, it's, it's anyone's guess. I mean, I mean we, we talk more about that later, but it, no, we'll get in. I definitely want to get into yeah. that because I have questions about, you know, where we're going to go in the future and how rapidly um, the science fields are actually advancing because technology is leapfrogging every year. But we'll yes. get into that. Let's. So we're obviously a history show. So we got to talk a little bit about what came before. I know that, you know, the Industrial Revolution is really credited to beginning with the cotton gin, which is really more technology than it is science, but science <laughs> helped create it. Were there other uh, innovations that really were aided by science in the late 18th and early 19th century that you can point to? Yeah. And um, so, you know, I guess, you know, the the printing press predates that a little bit, but that, you know, sort of Mm -hmm. being able to store and access uh, knowledge a little bit. And Mm -hmm. we might touch upon sort of our modern printing press, you know, the, Mm -hmm. the web later. Right. You know, but uh, absolutely it, it was this idea. And then, right. You have the cotton gin, which sort of, solves a lot of problems and creates others, right? Yes, you know, it did. Because it, uh, it, 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 it's got a mixed uh, um, brand. But then you have like the telegraph, you got the steam engine, you know, you have uh, um, uh, electrification, you know, alternating current, the generation mm-hmm. of power and its transmission and its storage, the combustion engine, you know, all of these things were products of the, of the 19th century at some point. Mm-hmm. And, a lot and all of these things were were american right you mm-hmm. know they were they were by americans and in the science community there was this idea that americans built things mm-hmm. and europeans discovered things right you know <laughs> so i i think i had i had uh, mentioned this to you in an email when we were prepping like if you were to describe the history of the of the us in science when would be the first time it come up mm-hmm. and, uh, and and oftentimes when you say, well, just tell me about the history of science, like, well, you know, there was Galileo and there was Newton and there was Einstein. And, and you're always listing Europeans, <laughs> you know, right. the even person? if they worked over here, they got their education over there. Right. You know, and then if I said, what about Americans? And people say, well, maybe Franklin, maybe Jefferson, mm-hmm. but then nothing, right? Nothing until um, kind of modern, uh, modern times, if, if, unless they were, you know, uh, people came over by immigration or something mm-hmm. like that. And so there was this idea like, yeah, America was a place where you invented things because you had to do stuff. You wanted to increase farming. You want to do transport goods, long distances. It's a big country. So, you know, railroads and roads and Mm -hmm. planes and stuff like this. These are things that we need to sort of do business in America. Or you created things to make money, you know, Mm -hmm. to make textiles or to make, um, you know, finely um, uh, tuned goods or or, or, uh, machines that could manufacture things with interchangeable parts. Mm -hmm. That was a huge problem, um, particularly like in the military and the Civil War. And, uh, you know, that they, they, you know, guns were essentially like custom made, you know, and if yours broke, you couldn't swap out a part with your friends, you know, this was a a huge um, issue. And so this was sort of like what Americans did well was the sort of uh, the technology portion of it built on top of um, perhaps a lot of trial and error. Well, yeah, and we went from being an agrarian society to people moving into the cities. And I'm sure there was a lot of innovation that was necessary because you suddenly have this wide open expanse and you've got to feed these people. You've got to house these people. As we talked about, at some point, you have to cool these people so that they can live in the southern part of the country. That's right. I mean, that's uh, I I still every time I go to Europe, I'm shocked at how they don't have air conditioning, I, at I least know. to the degree we do. No, I, I, I pun, pun intended. I yes. know, I, like every every time I'm in uh, I'm in France, and I'm just like, uh, this airport can open some windows. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it it's it's absolutely true. And then, of course, when people are together, 
you got to get the food in, you got to mm-hmm. get the waste out. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the people have to do something. You know, there has to be uh, jobs and uh, and uh, and then there has to be banking and then there has to be stuff for them to, you know, clothing and right. and, and this sort of stuff. Cities are their own sort of issue. And I think that there was this change in, in America about like, what do we want? You know, mm-hmm. like, um, we're about the same age. And so we could talk about the, um, the American dream mm-hmm. in, a, in a sort of serious way. And it's uh, for, for better or for worse, whether it's what we actually had or what we actually wanted, it was a sort of suburban life, white picket fence, mm-hmm. family, car, home, uh, fun weekends, these sort of things. Yep. But um, it's, it's about a city. It's actually about a suburb, but you know, mm-hmm. but people didn't always want that, right? You know, it's like people are like, well, what we really want is I want my own farm, or I want my own um, sort of wide open uh, stance, or uh, people in the city dream of living in the country. And mm-hmm. when did people in the country want to come in and live in the city? When was that the big shift? And it seems like that's like I don't know around World War One. I'm mm-hmm. not a historian, but you know, from from what I gather from from what I do know. It's uh, once people started to be able to travel around and, and see the benefits of, of, of city living. I mean, nothing against you know farming, but it's very hard, right? Mm-hmm. Now, farming is very difficult, right. uh, even particularly before we had you know farming implements and, and, and tractors. And it's 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 also the same every year. The uh, reason why farming communities tend to be very conservative is you can't mess around with it. You know, mm-hmm. if the, the crop fails, uh, people are going to starve and the, 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 the going to lose the farm, uh, literally. Right. So they, they kind of do what works and, and they change very slowly because mm-hmm. there's a lot at risk. You know, there's a, a lot to risk there. So when did the idea like what we really should do is build great cities, you know, sort of between the wars, you know, mm-hmm. start to build up uh, big cities. I think we hit the halfway point of people living in cities around like 1940. Mm-hmm. That's pretty late in the game, mm-hmm. uh, you know, from the history of the U.S. And then once you have cities, cities offer things that uh, farming communities can't. You know, uh, museums, um, universities, uh, you know, department stores, air conditioning, all these uh, sort of things. And it, you know, that's just sort of the direction we went in. Maybe we won't do that forever, but that's what we've done so far. Well, we certainly created these societies where where there was some financial security because you could fairly easily find a job doing something in a city where okay. you weren't reliant upon your your crop reaching fruition and being able to harvest it and sell it. You've got um, equipment that's requiring fewer people working on a farm. So we're, we're advancing from a technology standpoint, from a mechanical standpoint. Um, we even changed the seeds that are planted so that they're resistant to, I mean, this has all happened in the late 20th century and there's a pushback against that, not advocating one way or the other on it. Um, but certainly life on those farms has changed. That's right. Even like you said, the the crops, like with mm-hmm. the introduction of, uh, of dwarf wheat, right? Yep. Which was one of the hugest uh, sort of breakthroughs of the 20th century where the wheat normally grows very tall and you get a little cluster of it at the top. And they mm-hmm. designed it so it would grow much, much shorter. It grows faster. It doesn't blow over. It doesn't mm-hmm. break. Mm-hmm. I think that one invention has been credited with saving a billion lives from starvation. Right. They're doing, they're doing a similar thing with corn now where it, yep. it, it, it sprouts lower. And it, it's much more complicated. But And, and the, this is the part of the science. That there's different ways that plants make energy. Mm-hmm. Right? So we always say photosynthesis, right? But it turns out there's actually more than one kind of photosynthesis in plants. Mm-hmm. And rice uses a particularly inefficient kind, and they're trying to breed a kind of rice that uses a more efficient kind of photosynthesis, which may do for rice what dwarf wheat did for wheat, right? Wow. If they ever get that through, it would use a, a much, much less water to to grow the same amount of uh, of rice and things like that. So that hasn't happened yet, but it's it's clearly it's it's one of those things where we're applying physics and chemistry and biology to a problem that really matters, uh, which is world hunger, right? Well, I was, and resources because water is becoming a scarce resource, especially out West. I grew up in Seattle. Yep. It's a rainforest and yet they have droughts. Yep. I mean, it's kind of shocking to me and the population has exploded. So the demands on the natural resources in the area are tenfold at least. I mean, it's, it's amazing to me. I went back and visited a couple of years ago I don't recognize the city. I don't recognize mm-hmm. any of the area where I grew up. 
Yeah. You know, it was a long time ago that I left there, but it's kind of surprising to me. So let's talk a little bit about um, the 20th century science development. What was going on here in the U.S.? And obviously, I'm going to point to the Manhattan Project because I know that's a big turning point. That is kind of the turning point for what we would call big science. Yeah. Right. So just to, to give a name check here, there was a couple of very pivotal experiments done in the U.S. in the early 20th century uh, one was called the Michelson-Morley experiment, which discovered that the speed of light was constant oh. um, and that it didn't have a preferred direction. And that was in uh, 1905. I think it was published, uh, give or take. And I think that was done in St. Louis. And the uh, experiment sort of um, made Einstein deeply aware of this, this idea, which led to the theory of relativity and general relativity and, and, and all of that sort of history. So that was a good sort of thing that um, uh, that Americans did. And then, of course, the, the development of uh, quantum mechanics, mostly done in Europe, but also by some people, you know, here in, in, in the U.S. or people who had been in Europe and came to the U.S. But the, the and this led to the quantum revolution, understanding atoms and then atoms. And then people said, well, some of the times atoms fall apart because they there's a, this kind of decay, this you know, radioactive decay. And sometimes we can make them fall apart. And when we do, a little bit of energy comes out of it. And people said, well, you know, what also gives a little bit of energy is, you know, like uh, explosives. Uh, maybe you can, you know, um, gunpowder and dynamite. This is a chemical explosive, right? So if we go one more level down in our little hierarchy, could mm -hmm. we create an explosion at the physics level of the matter inside, right? The nuclear matter. Could we create a nuclear explosion? And yeah, we could. Um, but as an engineering feat, it's, it was a huge problem, right, mm -hmm. to create. I mean, we had to find this special kind of you know, stuff, this radioactive stuff. We had to filter out because it turns out there's all different kinds. So they needed some uranium and there's different kinds of uranium. And the kind that we needed was the really rare kind. So we had to figure out how to filter the kind we needed from the kind we didn't, that we could get enough of it we could get enough of it and store it safely. And that, it, I mean, like every single smart person in the U.S. got sort of wrangled into this Manhattan Project, thousands and thousands of people at different sites, all managed, all funded to kind of build this one goal. In fact, just as a little pause, I, I, I when I was writing to you about this, and I was thinking like, if he brings this up, I want to pitch this idea for a TV show. Okay, <laughs> so, let's know, pitch this, it. <laughs> uh, you know this 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 movie uh, about the 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 cops who are left over when all the good cops are gone. It's called like the other guys. Yep. Like we could do the other guys, but with scientists, because like everybody go. who was really smart went to the Manhattan Project. Uh huh. Leaving the universities filled with the sort of second tier. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is not. Fair, right? Everyone <laughs> had a, a faculty job there was probably. Well, we're not going to name names, though. No, we're no. going to make sure. But, but when all the superstars were off building the bomb, somebody had to sort of keep the uh, the lights on, and uh, you could make like a fun little comedy uh, uh, show about this. But I pictured a bunch of TAs who haven't finished their PhDs yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and everyone they show up one day, and all the professors are gone. <laughs> That's exactly. It's like, well, so. Particle physics. What do I know? Hmm, yeah. yeah, yeah. So we're gonna go back to pendulums. Here. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk yeah. about gravity. Yeah. No, yeah. 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 What do you? What do you? What have you, what have you heard? You know. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, um, so they, so we have the bomb, and, and yeah. we'll just leave that aside for now, and because it, mm -hmm. it clearly changed the, the world, mm -hmm. but it also changed the way that we looked at at science, as that it wasn't, um, it wasn't a professor here or an engineer there, or an idea in a paper written in German. Mm -hmm. It was something that could produce something if you got enough of the right people together working on a specific project. And so we didn't have a kind of research infrastructure in the United States, right? So if you wanted to do physics research and it was bigger than could fit on a tabletop, right? We had this tabletop science or one laboratory mm -hmm. or that you couldn't fund out of your own pocket because you were some, you know, rich guy or something like that, then it was just never going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. And then we had this model where all these people came together and created uh, this, uh, you know, this, this science output. And they said, well, well, maybe we could do that for other things. Maybe... This idea of having a university 
and an industry and a, and a sort of a, a, and a military complex, maybe we could kind of build all these things together for better, or for worse. And funding, the and most funding, important part. Right? That maybe the government should put some mm -hmm. money aside to, to, to build things. Um, I always used to say, you know, like, uh, this is something else I had written to you, that in the Constitution, patents mm -hmm. are mentioned as mm -hmm. a protection of scientific research, which made the first draft and free speech did not. <laughs> you know, right. That was, that was the, 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 the amendments. So there was an idea that science was important to the U.S. It's just um, it needed to be done in a different way. So there was some very influential people who tried very hard to create a kind of science infrastructure where the government would fund projects. And I have to say that in the early years, many people were really against this. Mm -hmm. um, some of the professors didn't want to be associated with kind of real things. You know, they sort of took this platonic ivory tower idea of academia and they didn't, they didn't want to be a part of it. The military wasn't so interested because a lot of scientists weren't soldiers and they didn't want to work with people who weren't soldiers or hadn't experienced combat. There was a sort of a, an issue there with getting them to, to accept um, outside ideas. I know this doesn't happen today at all in no. any <laughs> of anything, but, uh, and, and then of course the government wasn't sure if they wanted to, to you know, pony up the money. So, sure. uh, but, but it did eventually come together um, and different agencies um, decided to either, you know, fund things directly or to start to, to create research projects. So um, there was this guy and his name was Vannevar Bush. And uh, he used to run um, the, the he, he sort of ran the organization, the science part that, that helped put the Manhattan Project together. Mm -hmm. And he was a science advisor. And he eventually got people to come together and build what became the National Science Foundation, mm -hmm. uh, which predates, you know, sort of other funding agencies for, for science. Now lots of different places fund science and a lot of private uh, organizations fund pure science because some people who really loved science made a great deal of money and they want to do something, you know? And so there's, there's a people who made billions and billions of dollars and they set aside billions and billions of dollars mm -hmm. just to have their name on a telescope or to, uh, to, uh, to do research that uh, is just sort of outside the reach of, um, um, of even governments, you know, that that's hard to say working for the government, but some of these people have bu budgets larger than we do uh, when it comes to all the, the science they do. And why not? Right. If they're, if I they're, applaud their altruism, but in all honesty, it's like, yeah, if you want to give money to a subject that you are particularly passionate about and you have the means to do so, yeah. write the check. I mean, exactly. I mean, we can, we can all look at the old train stations, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> Carnegie and these guys built and stuff and say like, well, you know, if he had built a telescope, I mean, we don't use trains so much anymore. Maybe, right. uh, maybe this, uh, things would have been, that would have been uh, different, but you know, mm -hmm. that was, that was their altruism of the time. I'm going to mm -hmm. build a, a, a great train station or a public library or, or something like that. And now we have, uh, this instead, um, which I think is, it, it, it's different. I think it's a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. Not everybody does, but, uh, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's great. Yeah. So, World War II organized scientists in a way that had never been done before. And then they could start to pool resources and pool ideas and to sort of achieve and build things that just simply could not be done in the old system. What about the advent of nuclear power? I'm curious because you're talking about, yeah, go ahead. You know where I'm going with this. The yeah, Manhattan so Project really kind of opened our eyes to the possibilities of nuclear energy. That's right. And, you know, it, um, so there's always, you know, and maybe this is too, too vague or high level or something. There's always the world and then the world as we see it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the realities of nuclear power are tricky because it has many distinct advantages. It also has some very distinct disadvantages, uh, to, you know, when it comes to, if it isn't done correctly, it, it, mm -hmm. it can be bad. But, um, the thing is like, we're kind of used to, generating power in a way that's already bad in many ways you know coal plants have their own issues mm -hmm. um you know boiler plants still have uh, explosions people have been in the, the the manufacturing of coal and you know the digging it and everything it, it has its, its 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 issues um nuclear power has a different set of issues mm -hmm. so does wind power so does geothermal you know so does mm -hmm. uh, uh, getting power from yeah um even solar power uh, um, has it sort of ups and downs mm -hmm. when it comes to efficiency and cost and, and things like that. 
but we're kind of moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So we can't go backwards. You know, we can we could uh, probably debate the, the the rationality of 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 nuclear energy for as long as we want, but once we built it, it's sort of with us. You know, right. it's, it's sort of we're not going to get rid of it. So I think the best thing to do is to, to figure out how to use it as best we can. Well, I think the the most reasonable argument that I've heard recently is that we need a combination of all of these different technologies. So we're not reliant upon one thing. We're not reliant upon coal exclusively or wind power or solar exclusively because there are parts of the country that don't get that much sun. Right. I lived in Seattle. And, trust me. It wasn't yeah, always yeah. a sunny day. <laughs> yeah. And I, I grew up in Phoenix and I, I, yeah. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you're right. I think it's one of these things that's like a, an all hands on deck. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that um, if there was one perfect technology mm -hmm. that satisfied everybody, we'd already be using it. Right. Yeah. The point is, there isn't there's 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 niches for mm -hmm. different kinds of power right if i wanted to build a satellite to go to pluto it's not going to run on solar for very long right mm -mm. but if over the last 50 years i built a very very small nuclear reactor that would mm -hmm. right you know if we wanted to put a, a community on mars mars gets about half the sunlight that the, the that earth does because it's further away and um solar panels will go so far but Mars is a very dusty place, right? And so they they would get coated. We would need some other kind of power, mm -hmm. at least in the beginning, right? And if we had never refined nuclear reactors or nuclear energy, then we'd be kind of out of luck. Mm -hmm. it, it would just be off the table. And so you know, yes, you know, there's everything has its its pl its uh, pluses and drawbacks. And mm -hmm. you know, it, uh, I think we just we do have to kind of. Um, take a very pragmatic approach when it comes to these things. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm curious, um, we moved from the Manhattan Project in the 1940s to the space program, which really starts in the 50s, goes into the 60s. Right. Let's talk a little bit about science in this country and how it moved that space program forward. Well, so there was this little bit of a, it was a boom and bust kind of time, mm -hmm. right? Because um, scientists coming out of World War II we're very quick to say science won the war, right? <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Which is not probably really 100% true, right? I mean, it was within yep. all hands on deck. But mm -hmm. um, certainly people, when they talked about it, there became this idea that science was going to be an enormous part of the, the future of the country. Like I said, this endless frontier, right? You know, is that finance and engineering and, uh, and, and, and agriculture, and many, they have limits and science doesn't. It was something that we could put money into forever and it would forever give back this sort of return on what we wanted. And this was the idea. And uh, is, you know, I went to college, uh, graduate school at uh, Stony Brook, which was founded like in the early 60s. And I remember them showing us plans about the size, like they wanted to build these giant physics and math departments. And I was in the physics department. They said, yeah, the physics department there was supposed to house five hundred graduate students and and we were just like because that's that's almost half of all the phds granted the year i got mine mm -hmm. you know and so it's like they that one university was gonna the, the every university in the u.s wanted these enormous science programs to train this huge uh number of of scientists and engineers and 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 and, uh, and this and it kind of glommed onto the space race you know because here was a sort of a big pool of money with a very specific goal mm -hmm. and it was a number of technical problems and everyone was interested and and there was sort of an infinite amount of things to learn mm -hmm. and then it ended right you know and it it, it sort of came to this sort of a screeching stop um and you know nasa is very aware of, of of doing these things that when they set a goal you know it's 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 not a destination you know as they they talk about it now you know it's not like well it's not to get to the moon it's to it's to inhabit the moon. It's not to get to Mars. It's to get to Mars and get back. And what? How do we? How do we do these sort of things? Mm -hmm. And the problem with the the space program was it was it was all for this one thing to put a man on the moon. And there was very little thought, or at least publicly, and there wasn't. And then what? Right? Well, that's a PR problem too, because yeah. So we did it. I mean, you win the World Series. The best you can hope is to come back next year and make it to the finals and win the world series again, but it's never going to be as exciting as that first time. 
That that's right. And um, you know, do we need like do we need to inhabit the moon? Mm-hmm. Is a very realistic question, right? You know, like if we had the if we had the technology at the time. We would ask, like, to do what? Now, I understand there's science, right? And I understand that I'm also a little bit in the minority among scientists who have this sort of um, thought on the subject. But it's like um, going to Mars is a good idea, but living there, I'm not sure is. (laughs) And the real question is, like, when do we go to Mars? Right? Like, Mm -hmm. um, I'll be very careful with how I say this, but Mars will always be there. Right. Right. And so if we decide the money we're going to use to send a man to Mars or a woman to Mars or, or what have you, we're going to, for the next hundred years, we're going to send a rover there every year for a hundred years. Mm-hmm. What could we learn versus putting a person there? Now, right. I completely understand people are different from robots and they experience things in a different way. And it would be an enormous achievement for manned space flight to actually fly back and forth to Mars. Mm-hmm. But from a pure science perspective, it seems like another round of of non you know non crewed missions is the way to go. Uh, right. Now, not everyone agrees with me with that. Right? You know, some people think that there's no no substitute for for for, for putting people there. So, uh, when it comes to the history, they would put all this money in, and yeah. then all of a sudden there were too many scientists, and there was a huge problem with the with the people finding positions and and staying in academia. And these people went into industry. Mm-hmm. And started a lot of companies, you uh-huh. know, with their bright ideas. And you know, we sort of uh, we sort of get the introduction of electronics. Yeah, we sort of get the introduction of the personal computer. And this is some of this is sort of left over from the end of the space race, where there was this highly trained, highly educated, highly motivated um, scientific workforce that no longer was in academia, was no longer you know putting people on the moon. They needed to do something else. Mm-hmm. And they took these technologies and they perfected them into other areas, like you know personal electronics and, and personal you know computing, mm-hmm. which probably changed the world a lot more than going to the moon did. Oh, absolutely! I remember uh, my father had an electronics company. I think we talked about this off camera one time on one of our shoots, but um, you know he was very instrumental in the miniaturization of printed circuit boards. Right. It was a government contract, so the government was really paying to have this done. This would have been in the early seventies. Um, and it was fascinating to see that when he first started his company, he was approached to buy a computer that would have allowed him to basically, you know, uh, manage his checkbook. That was pretty much the extent of the power of this computer that would have taken up an entire office and been so incredibly slow. And by the time we had started miniaturizing these circuit boards and increasing the ability of information that it could process, it, it was helping us send people, you know, to the moon, whatever. I mean, it really was fascinating what they were able to do. That would not have happened. And he, I remember at the time, he had probably about 150 employees working at the company, including scientists who were there just trying to figure out what metals were the most conductive, which ways they could actually create the circuit boards and all of this. I'm sure it's stuff that you know, but I mean, he was he was on the cutting edge of this. And I look back on that and I really find it fascinating. Yeah. And nobody knew anything mm-hmm. about it. Like, uh, you know, we had these sort of general ideas of how we should build circuits. Mm-hmm. But, you know, eventually somebody said, hey, you know, what about like silicon? Like th- mm-hmm. at one point, that was not what we were doing. You know, it was something else. And then we moved to silicon and then we moved to these the miniaturized mm-hmm. circuits. And, and one of the big um, discoveries of the time was the the transistor, right, which which may be the most a uh, created object ever created by man, right? Like we, mm-hmm. I think they, something like 70 quintillion of these things have been produced because, you know, there's hundreds of millions in every little yep. microchip. And it's such an easy idea because, you, 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 you know, I know you're not a science guy, but you know what a wire is, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so a wire <laughs> runs electricity in one direction, mm-hmm. right? And then we invented this thing called a, a diode, which mm-hmm. lets electricity run in only one direction. It can't mm-hmm. go backwards, right? And a transistor is kind of like a stop sign for electricity. It lets it through if it's like a three three junction. So if if there's a little power coming on one side, then it lets it through on the other. And if there isn't, it stops. Or vice versa. I forget exactly how. Mm-hmm. But it basically it can turn a circuit on and off. It makes it discrete. It makes gotcha. it digital. And 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 you might seem to like, wow, who cares? Like, what? Why is that great? Because 
any problem that can be calculated, and this goes back to like the birth of, of sort of modern math and stuff, but any problem that can be calculated can be turned into a machine. Mm -hmm. and any machine can be done out of these little gates, right? If you have mm -hmm. enough of them. So you, you may ask something very funny, like what is the 17 trillionth prime number, right? Not a very useful problem, but it's very specific. Mm -hmm. But I could build a circuit that answers just that problem based on this new technology that existed, this, this transistor, and we could miniaturize it. And every time you hit the button, I mean, it's silly because we could calculate and we know, I don't know it off the top of my head, but we know what that number no, is. But there is a number. It does exist. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But anything that can be turned into an algorithm mm -hmm. can be can be calculated uh, on these things. And so people started to think even very early in the game, mm -hmm. like, well, OK, um, can we make uh, people? Are people algorithmic enough? Uh, the way we talk, the way we think, the way we act, can we create an intelligence uh, artificial intelligence. I knew we were going to get there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Can we create it out of uh, out of machines? Um, and that there's yeah, there's there's so much to say about about something like this. Mm -hmm. It's in the news a lot right now. You know, but what we're doing is a very specific kind of thing. So you know, no no one knows the answer to it, and we could talk a little bit about how it works and the challenges and something. I'm I'm, I'm all up for that if you're interested. Mm -hmm. But if, if um, if we act like an algorithm, if we act like something that's computing things at some level, then we could. Mm -hmm. It is something that could be done outside of a of a brain. It can be recreated with uh, with circuits, okay. and that that goes to the, the foundation of the of the way we we think about computing. Mm -hmm. With the caveat that we know there are things that can't be calculated. Right. I'm. So I I have an electric car, which everyone sees on the show. So it's not like I'm releasing any secret information or any, yeah, mm -hmm. bragging about it. That is is arguably able to drive itself quite well, though incredibly imperfectly. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a feature that I use often because I, maybe I'm too old and I don't feel that comfortable with it. Um, I've had a few scares already where it feels like a car is moving over too close and it pushes me into the next. It's just not, it's imperfect. Right. Where are we going to go with that? What's the future? Are we going to have self-driving cars? What's your take on it? So I'm going to answer your question, but I want to, I, I feel the same way. I've, I've never yeah. been in a self-driving car. Yeah. And well, but next time you I, come up, we'll go for a yeah, ride. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I feel that I wouldn't trust it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I was reading this thing about um, about uh, when people would get into elevators and there was an elevator operator mm -hmm. and then they would they introduced push button elevators and people mm -hmm. were like, nope, nope, I don't trust it if it's not being run by a machine. <laughs> and uh, and I just think of myself like in some years, people are going to think of me that way. Uh -huh. you know, there's old man field. He won't get in the uh, self-driving car. That's or... OK. I'll be standing outside with you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would not get into a taxi that's self-driving. I wouldn't. Yeah, I, I, for for the way they work now, I I, I agree with you. So, um, will there be self-driving cars? The answer is one hundred percent yes. Yeah. Right. Um, are we going? Are they going to become normal? Uh, are they? Are we going to stop learning how to drive? You know, like uh, I want to say no. But again, it's this idea of the way the world is and the way we think of the world, mm -hmm. right? Is that a lot of the problems that people have with self-driving cars is that they trust them too much. Mm -hmm. Like like you've said, you know, that people get it. E even when cruise control first came out, people would oh, come uh, Yeah, you hear the you know, stories of people I, taking a nap. You're like, no, I put it on, right? Yeah. Cruise control should it, and, and uh, but that joke is replaying itself again with self-driving cars, mm -hmm. but to, it's better, right? It's like really mm -hmm. make it. Well, yeah, it's better than that. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, I think that the way I see it is, it's simply a matter of of, of computational speed. This mm -hmm. problem, I believe, can be solved with the technology we have if it was just a little bit better, right? That it's mm -hmm. it's not a moonshot. It's uh, it's a four minute mile, right? Mm -hmm. Is that we're almost there. And once people do it, people will do it regularly, and it will become a standard part of, of 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 how we do things. And I think the real trick will be of whether or not people trust them. 
Mm-hmm. Cause you know, cars, you know, cars kill as many people as heart attacks, you know, and, uh, and if a company were to introduce self-driving cars and that number went to half, mm-hmm. I mean, half is still a lot of deaths, no, but, but it's it better half. And then the year after that, it went half to that. Then people would be like, this, this is the, this is the future even though there would certainly be news stories about um, people who did silly things or the, the thing it yeah. was an error, um, you know, pl- plane travel is extraordinarily safe, but people are still a little bit afraid of it. And, and mm-hmm. when there's a problem, it, it's a catastrophic problem. Right. Mm-hmm. But I think that in general, that technology is going to become within our lifetime, it'll become pretty normal. And, uh, and me and you will just, uh, you know, walk on the side of the road. And dig the, <laughs> the There's cars. no one driving that car, Brian. Look, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> no, I'll tell that. you what I, what I have come to realize is I would feel more comfortable if all of the cars around me were also part of some neural network that was controlling speed position, all of that. The, the incident that scared me the most is when I was on a highway and I was using the, you know, driving feature and the lines in the road disappeared because there was construction going on and yeah. the car had no idea what to do. And so it stopped. Yeah. Going or, 60 miles an hour and the car stops. Right. I almost had, we almost rear ended. And I'm like, cause it couldn't make that decision. I can see where the lane should be and make that decision. Yep. Or the other sample of a guy had one of these where the car would come get him feature, you know, it hit it. Oh yeah. And, the, the, yes. mm-hmm. and a, his friend like uh, put a painted a circle around his car in mm-hmm. the side of the road and the car was trapped. Yep. Right. Cause yep. It, it, uh, it, it was like a magic when you put salt around the, the warlock, you know, or something. Yes, get out. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, uh, the car is like, no, I can't move. There's lines in, in all directions. And it was, it was like one of these funny little, funny little things that happen. But um, I think, you know, like there's always sort of edge cases, special cases that the technology doesn't do. And and one day it'll be something else, but yeah. Yeah. uh, It's just, we're just not quite there. I know one of these days, I also, I saw 2001 a space odyssey. I don't want Hal telling me I can't get in my car. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, I have an identical twin brother and he's like, well, this, uh, you know, he, uh, he, yeah. you know, his ID got some, some, he was drinking tonight, so we're not letting you in the car, you know, right. you, play your part, you know, so, you know, there's, there's always going to be some, some issues, but um, I think that this is an idea whose time has come so much goes into our sort of car culture. And mm-hmm. if, if, if um, auto cars, they, they're more fuel efficient, if they're safer, if mm-hmm. they're easier, if they, that they remove some of the, the burdens of modern society, mm-hmm. it'll be like a washing machine or a refrigerator or the ice box. Like, you know, we have to, it'll just yeah. become a convenience that yeah. people, you know, just it, uh, adapt right away. You're right. The 20 year olds today are going to think it's, it's natural. It's, it's we're normal. just older and like, no. So I'm curious, we talked a little bit about artificial intelligence. What else do you think is coming down the pike? What are some other innovations that we'll live long enough to see? Uh, well, I'm just have, curious what you're thinking. Yeah. yeah. So there's 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 two that popped into my head right away. Yeah. Um, one physics related and and one not. So the physics is uh, perhaps we'll get fusion power. Mm. Um, there's an old joke in the fusion industry that fusion power is always 30 years away um, because <laughs> it's like they're the kind of always have problem. But we have mm. actually very recently made some very large um, uh, leaps forward uh, in this. It's nowhere near done. It's Mm. it's not prototyped. And, you know, next year there'll be something working. But 30 years now does sound like an actual time frame. Okay. And, you know, whoever cracks that problem will um, will save the world. Right. Because that's sort of free, unlasting, clean burning energy. And then we may have a one size kind of fits all um, solution to uh, to to things. So I would hope I would hope that we crack that nut. Okay. Um, the other thing is that I think that um, we spend so much of our time with computers hmm. that I've always felt that there is a natural progression to, if not virtual reality, augmented reality, right? Which is like that uh, we would, you know, I'm wearing glasses now. If they, in the, and I know there's been things that look like this that did this that failed, right? right? You know? But I feel that because we require this 
input of data all the time. You know, I mean, how many conversations have you had like this? Oh, yeah. This oh, thing, God, yeah. Right. And, um, and that's fine, right? But if we remove that part of it and people are able to get at that information in a more seamless way or in a less uh, obnoxious way, maybe we should say, then I think that people will give anything for it. <laughs> you know, um, but imagine, cause you were teaching college, you were teaching university students and I'm sure that, you know, phones in the hand was an issue. What if they don't have phones, but they they're wearing glasses and they're actually watching a, you know, a movie while you're trying to lecture and you have no idea what's going on. I mean, yeah, I know it, that's a risk <laughs> and, and, and it'll happen. And, you know, like I had a, when I first started teaching, um, some of the older professors are having real problems with the phones mm -hmm. and, uh, the, and, and, and things like, you're not going to get rid of phones and you're not going to get them to stop using them. But, uh, but one of, one of the older professors I was working with had some story of like, well, I couldn't keep the kids from daydreaming either. <laughs> you know, like, I, 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 you know, like you can get them there, you can lead the horse to water. Right. And at some yeah. point there's gotta be some personal responsibility because we could say the same thing about like, um, this chat GPT sort of generative oh, uh, right. text, right? For college professors, that's becoming to, to be in a, a, a more difficult um, uh, nut to crack. And eventually it'll just be kind of like, well, it wrote the first draft and I edited it and, and they'll seem perfectly normal. Or I took all your lecture notes and it summarized them for me uh, or, or, or some version of that. Um, I know every, everybody's read, you know, the, the grasshopper and the ant, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, you go to college to learn certain things. And if you're there, yeah, you, you can get, you can skate through, you can skate through lots of things in, in your life, right up until it really matters. You know, <laughs> like if, so, if somebody never learned to drive because of their self-driving car, but they had to pass a driver's test to get the car in the first place. And it turns out they didn't really do their homework. Then there's going to come a time when they're going to pay for that choice. Right? Absolutely. Should have paid more attention in class. That That's right. And, uh, and, you know, hopefully whatever happens to that is, is, you know, just that one person has a problem that this person isn't flying a plane or yeah. running a, a business or a crypto exchange, you know, that crashes, or something, right. That, that it sort of minimizes these sort of problems. Mm -hmm. But in the end, I think that these ideas will will be re relegated by the responsibility of of living life right mm -hmm. because if they forget how to um I don't know, wire something or do a diagram or something like that yeah that little kind of looking up of things or the, if it eases the learning process you know or allows them to explore things deeper then i'm all for it right but if they're using it as a crutch you know it's like the guy in our yeah. time would write right on their hand and then and then they'd uh, they'd pass the test, but then they couldn't uh, they couldn't do a job interview or something like that. Right. You know, it comes back. So, yep, never really learned anything. Yeah, yeah, it it's just some newer version of that, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, um, it 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 said, I don't know I, I was a, I was a pretty diligent student, and you know, I saw people, you know, take easy shortcuts and stuff. And I can't say that it never happened to me, but it, it was pretty rare. Mm -hmm. And you know, I don't see these people anymore. You know, right. they ended up having to do something else. And mm -hmm. um, my parents were very vocal about that kind of thing, about being ready for 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 what life uh, brings you. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll see some sort of resurgence of those ideas. We can hope. We can hope. I'm curious, um, give a little advice to any younger listeners who might be out there. So imagine we have a high school student who's graduating from a really good STEM program, what would you tell that student to pursue? What what particular areas do you think are going to grow? Yeah, um, boy, that's put that's you on the a, spot here. <laughs> yeah, so um, somebody once told me that when you graduate high school, the job you'll probably have in twenty years doesn't exist yet. Oh, I like that. Yeah. So, um, so this person was telling me that I should study as many things as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and to give myself a very broad base, which is kind of what the universities in the in the 19th century, <laughs> this liberal arts mm -hmm. um, uh, kind of thing. Um, I don't know. So, so there's a, a, a kernel of truth to that. I think that that broadening and and, and finding things and becoming an expert um, at at things that really interest you um, is a good idea. But I think that um, 
what I would suggest to people is to think about what's important in their life and to focus on that, right? Because when it comes to ac academics, there's people who are going to be happy studying computers. There's people who are going to be happy studying history. There's going to people who are going to be happy not going to college or, or or what have you. As long as that's important to you, you know, I think you'll be you'll be very happy with mm -hmm. things, right? And you know, the jobs that come along are going to come and go. And you know, if you're only going to be happy being the youngest tenured professor at Harvard, then you have a real specific thing to go. Right. But if your goal is to, you know, sort of be a happy person and a happy life and and these sort of things, then what you really have to do is make sure that what you're doing is is that. Mm -hmm. And uh, mind you, like, you know, playing video games for a living, I use it probably isn't going to make you a lot of money. But what do I know? There are people who make, you know, you'd be surprised <laughs> making money playing video games, right? Friend of mine's son got a job working. Uh, there are these tournaments that happen online of these huge. Uh, He's making a living uh, running these games, right? And and so, what when, do we know? <laughs> yeah, but but when opportunities like that come around, you have to be ready to kind of you know hit hit while the iron's hot. I don't know. I mean, I hope your friend has a long and his son has a long and happy life. Yes, I wouldn't bet that that what he has now will last. Right, right. So you put what he can into it now and mm -hmm. realize that it's going to evolve, you know, into something else. Right. I, um, specifically, to get back to the specific advice, <laughs> uh, I think computers are only going to be more important in the future. I think I can fairly certainly say that computers mm -hmm. will only become more important as we go forward. And I don't want to sound like the old man on the elevator, but a lot of younger students, my college students, had a real problem using computers well. Mm -hmm. Right? They they could get by, and they could do what they were very specifically trained to do, but they didn't have a general great use of computers. And being good at computers doesn't mean good on your phone or good at games. Being good at computers is making them work and do things that they they were designed to do well and things that they weren't designed to do at all, right? Mm -hmm. That skill, I think, is the most transferable skill of the 21st century. So... Uh, whatever your chosen field is, you know, learn how to use its tools, learn how to use them well, and uh, and I think that you'll you'll be set up for for the future. That that's my general advice. I think it's great advice. I hope that, uh, that my imaginary you know graduating high school student pays attention, heeds your advice. I think it's really good. <laughs> it's really solid. Well, this has been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. I've learned so much. It's been fascinating listening to you talk about your passion. Um, can you tell us anything about your job now? I don't know what you're allowed to say. Can you tell us a little oh, bit what's going on? Well, I should say that this is uh, these are all my own personal opinions and do not yep. reflect that of the U.S. Department of Energy. Right. Uh, but yeah, I stopped being a professor about a year and a half ago, and I moved uh, um, to work in the Office of High Energy Physics in the uh, uh, Office of Science within the Department of Energy. And uh, we are the largest uh, funder of um, research, uh, physics research, fundamental physics research in the United States. Uh, and probably in the world, um, perhaps maybe not some of these private organizations. Mm -hmm. And uh, the part of it that I sort of manage is the part that's involved with the research in the, in what's called the cosmic frontier. Mm. And that's uh, looking at uh, things like uh, dark matter and dark energy uh, specifically. So um, we have uh, national labs that do research and we have universities that do research. And all together, it's you know, less than 100 groups, but uh, of that order. And I make sure that they're, you know, when they propose things, that they're reviewed and and, and funded uh, appropriately and and uh, keeps it running. So I have to be trained as a scientist to understand and talk with them, but it's a, more of a, a managerial position. And it's part of the sort of big science um, mm -hmm. that we were talking about earlier. There's right. nothing um, classified about it. There's nothing uh, funny going on. It's just, um, it's just um, a very high level um, physics research around the world. 
Oh, come on. You can tell us about Area 51. We all know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This interview is over, Ken. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Who's that man in the black suit behind you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to send you an app on your phone. Just click it and stare right into it. Okay. <laughs> Hold it up to your face and you'll see a light. <laughs> It'll erase everything we talked about. <laughs> it's so funny. Well, this has been fun. That's a good note to end on here. <laughs> so um, our audience knows they can learn more about our show and the podcast at our website, Drive by history.org do you want to give out the website for the u.s department of energy is there so any information energy. that we can glean you, from there you can go to energy.gov science and uh you can find out all about the u.s department of energy wonderful well this has been wonderful thank you again so much for joining us i look forward to having you up here and joining us on camera for another show thanks so much ken all right brian take care you too